Mm. Big mess. Big mess. Total shell damage. Jeez. It's just devastating. It's just, it's just molten almost looking, you know? It's like... It just must have raged with fire. Alright. Let's get out of here. Mir-1 completes the hull survey along the port side. Once again, the hull armor appears almost intact, in stark contrast to the ravaged superstructure. Incredibly, throughout the entire length of the armor belt, on both sides of the ship, only two holes were found which penetrated all the way through. Both were on the starboard side, indicating they were 16-inch shells from Rodney. Two other large caliber rounds punched through the lighter armor above the main belt. The British ships fired 2,876 shells at Bismarck. Over 700 of them were 14 or 16-inch shells which could have penetrated her side armor. The team is astounded to find that along 1,400 feet of side armor, there are only four penetrations, only four hits out of 700. If British shells weren't penetrating the hull, then they weren't sinking the ship. But what about torpedoes? Dorsetshire's crew claimed to have made three torpedo hits in the last few minutes before Bismarck sank. Could these have been the fatal blows? To find torpedo holes, the team now needed to survey the lower hull down at the mud line. Uh, Mike, we're seeing something pretty bizarre here. They have found something amazing. A gaping hole in the side of the ship over 100 feet long, with a surgically straight top edge. Clearly, this is no torpedo hole. But what is it? More of the long holes with the razor-straight top edges are found on both sides of the ship, fore and aft. Incredibly, it turned out that over 40% of the lower hull was completely missing. Instead of answers, the divers have found only more riddles. I'm virtually certain that the piece of red-painted Bismarck hull that we landed on, which was about 80 or 90 feet long, is the same piece that came from the hole, which would lead me to believe that some of the damage that we're seeing is not torpedo damage, it's impact damage. I think the ship comes down, hits that mountainside, bow first, buckles, and then flops down with absolutely enormous force, and the hull literally blows open. Pieces of the hull just go flying off, hundred, hundreds of feet long, and then the ship skidded off a thousand meters down the slope and came to rest. So we may never know what the torpedo damage was. Only a detailed exploration inside the hull using the ROV can provide the answers. Where, when the hull burst, it burst at weak points, and the weak points may have been created by torpedo impacts. So in these long holes, are we seeing that one end of the hole is one torpedo impact and the other end another, maybe? That might be a hole right there. All right, that looks, sure looks like a hole to me. Yeah, so this torpedo got them pretty well. Maybe we can get up into this hole a little bit. And we're going in. All right, we're, we are deep in now. So we are right where the torpedo exploded. And there it is. There's the torpedo bulkhead. It's pretty intact. You can see that it's not dented, it's not perforated, it's not buckled. It's absolutely seamless and perfect all the way down. So you can really see how it resisted the torpedo impacts. These holes would have been fuel tanks, water tanks, and they acted as a buffer zone so that torpedo impacts wouldn't kill people on the inside of the ship. The armored bulkhead was designed to withstand torpedoes, and it did. The thin tank walls were ruptured, but the inner bulkhead is intact. The ship's core has not been penetrated. 
Without flooding the core, the torpedoes could not have sunk the ship in those few final minutes. The, the, the interesting thing is that everything that we found in, a, in this kind of, you know, forensic examination of the ship supports their story and, and actually accounts for their survival. Admiral Tovey constantly closes the distance to her until finally they're firing almost level shots. Ironically, the point-blank range made the shelling ineffective because of the gun's flat trajectories. Rounds were skipping off the water or unable to penetrate deep enough to hit the lower hull. The shells were riddling the superstructure and decimating the crew, but not striking the armored core, not sinking her, just torturing her. To save themselves from this fury, the crew sank their own ship. With time running out, Carl, Walter, and Heinz knew they would soon have to make their way up into the hellstorm above. During the last battle, it was generally known that the signal had been given, abandoned ship. And so, rather than having a special exit route marked out, he simply joined the general parallel of people rushing to get out, joined them, and he always kept looking up to see if there was a whole daylight anywhere. And rather than plan an escape route, he simply followed those who were heading up towards light. He said, I walked past the officer's mess, my duty station, and all of a sudden I saw a shaft of light, and up I went. Two hundred men are pushing and shoving to get up through the port quarterdeck hatch, including First Officer Earls, who was given the order to abandon ship. The shell penetrates the armor on the port side and explodes among them, killing almost everyone. This hole was made by the shell which killed over 200 men in an instant. As he came up here, he went back this way to get to his locker to get a few personal items. Now, and this is where the water tight. Doors. And as he was standing right here, a shell came right through here. <laughs> and, he, and he ended up on his ass right here. Oh, it blew you, it blew you across the room. <laughs> That's a little yeah, translation. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Got it. Got on his ass. Got got it. Got that. Also, up, back when out. I came out onto the deck port side, most of this was already in flames and destroyed. There were wounded men everywhere. And just like the old Bismarck saying states here, here runs blood and iron, literally. This is exactly the path that Heinz Steg took when he escaped from the ship. He came out here and to the right, see where this fair lead is to the right? That was underwater. The ship was listed over to this side. So over here, the quarter deck was a watch. The blood was running down the decks from all the, the wounded men that were piled, dead, dismembered, still alive, right over here, probably from this huge shell explosion that, that was aft by the turret. There's a big hole in the deck right there. This is where Heinz Steg met a friend of his who had his legs blown off, right? Where the spotlight is right now, according to Heinz. The guy asked for a last cigarette, and Heinz gave it to him. Just 
Zunächst, wenn ich rauskam, da hat es sehr böse aussehen. Da waren viele Tote rumgelegen. When he came up, was aber teilweise at Dora, he said it was just a grisly scene. They were dead all around. The deck was red with blood. And by the ship listing, the water was sloshing through the bodies and the blood and sweeping it out again. So he continued towards the stern of the ship. Joined a group of about 20 or 25 people. And he remembers that Müllenheim Rechberg was there. And he said, okay now boys, let's inflate our life vests. And then he said a final Heil to the German people and to the fatherland, but not to Hitler. And then Karl remembers somehow they just slid off the deck and off the port side. Then jetzt ich will mich mal ganz simpel ausdrücken. Jetzt habe ich erst richtig gemerkt. Jetzt geht jetzt an den Kragen. Jetzt ist jetzt geht's. Jetzt kommt jetzt bist du dran. Jetzt. He said at this moment it just finally hit me. My God, this could be the end. This really could be the end. This is it. Und dann war man in Wasser gewesen. He slid into the water in a group, and he remembers for a little while the group was all around him, and they scattered in all directions, and to him it just looked like corks falling up and down on the sea. Alles aus einer zwei starken See gewesen. The Dorsetshire and the Maori went in to rescue survivors, but left after sighting a U-boat. A thousand men were left to die in the freezing water. And on board of the Dorsetshire, we became aware that they could be our friends as well, because of the way they treated us on board. We couldn't have been treated any better. That's how you treat friends, not foes. Sometimes you'll see a configuration that corresponds to a body, or you'll see the, the clothing laid out, you know. But you don't know, this might have just been a boot. Or it might have been a guy. There's no way to know, you know, because the, the remains disappear, only the leather stays. Michael Weiss, Michael Weiss, uh, everybody standing by, please uh, read the words on the plaque, over. Zum Gedenken den Tausenden von jungen Männern, die hier starben. In memory of the thousands of young men who died here and the thousands who died opposing this mighty ship, this wreck is their monument and a monument to the madness of war. This is Keldish, we acknowledge and receive your transmission uh, Walter would like to say something in return. Roger that. Wir Glücklichen erinnern uns der Kameraden. We greet those who can no longer be here, who could not make it home again. For 61 years, their home has been the bottom of the ocean. Rest in peace down there. Comrades, you are not forgotten. We will remember you, and hopefully in the time of peace. Did you receive transmission? Over. Yes, we copied you very well. Thank you for those words. 